Well, thank you, Jody, for leading us. I don't know about you, but there is something special about having everything stripped down and just hearing the voices of God's people. Praise God. Um, and I think it's sometimes it's good for us to take that stripped down and uh, um, get back to basics. Um, and what better time to do it than when our worship leader is out with COVID, right? So <laughs> we have been blessed the past couple weeks as they have been gone um, to have people step up and lead us in worship. So um, I think I told the board in my interview, I believe God called me to preach. He did not call me to do music. <laughs> so I am thankful for the people who step up and do that when, uh, when we need it. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. Well, five-year-old Becky answered the door, and there was a census taker that came by. And she told the census taker that her daddy was a doctor and that he wasn't home because he was performing an appendectomy. My, said the census taker, that is a big word for such a little girl to know. Do you know what that means? She said, I sure do. It means 1,500 bucks, and that doesn't even include the anesthesiologist. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouth of children comes great honesty. <laughs> oh, well, I'm offended. Okay. How many times have you heard that in the past few years? I'm offended. We hear those words a lot, I'm offended. Or when someone else who's offended, we say things like, oh, you're triggered or you're a snowflake. Um, but taking offense at things has grown more and more common these days. In fact, it seems that everywhere you look and just about everything you say, someone out there is probably offended. So I'm probably gonna offend someone here today. Uh, yeah, amen. <laughs> Um, yeah, that'll probably include this sermon. And so it just seems to be, it's not just a world problem, but it's a church problem as well. Um, and so this sermon is probably going to piggyback off of some of the things that I think have been discussed in the back room um, uh, for Sunday school class. But today we're going to talk about offense. For the past several weeks, we've been talking about making this shift from me to you. This is a shift away from self to others from selfishness to selflessness. Because as Christians, this is the life that we are called to. We are called to put others ahead of ourselves. We are called to love and serve others. And we talked about showing hospi hospitality to others. And last week we talked about how sometimes we have unwanted companions in our lives and um, how to make that shift even when the people are difficult. So you might be thinking at this point, well, what does offense have to do with shifting from me to you? Well, let me say this. When it comes to being offended, especially in the confines of the church, I'm willing to bet that 99 times out of 100, it's because we're making it about us. Right. I mean, that's what so much of taking offense really is. We make the comment or the situation or the joke or whatever it is, and we make it all about us. We internalize it, we get angry about something, and most of the time, I believe taking offense is probably an act of selfishness and making it about us. And this is a dangerous thing because what I know when I look at our culture is that offense is like a cancer. It latches onto a host, it grows, and it destroys. It divides people over issues and words and everything else. When we take offense and let it grow, there is no unity, there is no love, but that is not what we are supposed to be, especially in the church. Amen. Our verse this morning is a simple proverb, Proverbs 19, 11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So let's dive into this subject and talk about this idea of offense and its relationship to shifting from me to you. So the first thing we need to know is this. Offense is detrimental to our faith. Offense is detrimental to our faith. When we are easily offended or take on offense, it is detrimental to our walk with God in a large part because it is detrimental to our walk with one another. 
And we've already talked about that our relationship with God and our relationship to one another is inescapably linked. When our relationships here are not right, our relationship with God will not be right. Proverbs 18, 19 says this, A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Where offense is rampant, you see disunity. You see conflict. You see bad attitudes. And again, the thing about offense is it's really self-focused. They said this about me. How dare they? So often when we take offense, it really wasn't even meant as a bad thing towards you. Or it wasn't about you at all. They did that. Well, it must have been because of me. <laughs> well, a lot of times it wasn't because of you. But we make it about us, and we take offense, and that damages our relationships with one another, and in turn damages our witness and our faith. Let me put it simply. You cannot function properly as Christians if there is a spirit of offense and bitterness and unforgiveness in you. You cannot function properly. I can't always assume the worst of my fellow Christians and have healthy relationships with them. I can't be angry all the time and have a right spirit within me. And so shifting from me to you on this subject, I first have to realize that when I get offended or take offense, it may say more about me than it does about others and hurts my walk with God and others more than it hurts theirs. (laughs) And that's why the next thing we need to know is this. Taking offense is a choice. Taking offense is a choice. Ecclesiastes 7, 21 through 22 says this, Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that how many times you yourself have cursed others. Do you hear the choice in that? It says, choose to not take to heart what others say. And besides, let's face it, you've probably said some pretty offensive things about them as well. (laughs) So choose not to take it to heart. Proverbs 17, 9 Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Again, there is a choice here. We can choose to get past an offense. We can choose to not repeat it and escalate it, or we can choose to take offense and in the end probably make matters worse. And this is so important as the people of God because here's what I've observed over the years, that so much of the conflict that happens with people in the church was never meant to hurt them in the first place. There are times when people, even Christians, are just nasty and mean towards each other, and that's a whole different sermon. Um, And we talked about that as we went from the in the series Me to We. But so much of what is taken offense at was never meant for harm. It was never meant to be taken the wrong way. But if we take it the wrong way and we repeat it, we have created conflict where no conflict was necessary. So can I just say this? In the church with one another as a people of God, give one another the benefit of the doubt when it comes to their intentions. Give one another the benefit of the doubt when it comes to their intentions. Try to put yourself in their shoes and see what they really meant. And if it's not clear, go talk to them and see what they really meant. I will almost guarantee you'll find that what you took offense at was not meant for harm, 99% of the time. It really is a choice. Stuff happens in all relationships and misunderstandings happen and conflicts happen, but you can always make a choice of what to do with it. Again, our passage this morning, good sense makes someone slow to anger. And it is his glory to overlook an offense. It basically says that choosing to not get offended is a glorious thing to those with good sense. <laughs> and this should make, our, make its way into all parts of our lives, I think, with our work people, with people who think differently than us. And can I even say with maybe even those who had the intent to hurt us? If we are slow to anger, it is a glorious thing for those with good sense. We can still overlook offenses when it was a purposeful offense. And it will lead to a healthier spiritual life, a healthier mental life, and a better witness for Christ when we do. So again, don't make it all about you. Don't assume the worst of your fellow Christians, but make a choice to not 
have your automatic response be to get up in arms and offended. But make the choice, because it really is a choice, to not take offense. And that leads to number three, and that is we are called to forgive an offense. Now this is where we start stepping on toes and it gets tricky, right? <laughs> We're called to forgive an offense. Um, again, in the church, give each other the benefit of the doubt. But even if there is ill intent of another person, we are called to forgive them. Luke 17, 3 for 4, Jesus says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a tough verse for me. I mean... He sins against you seven times in one day. Man, I'm thinking at like number three, I'm like, huh, you're out of luck, buddy. We're done here, right? <laughs> but Jesus says, if he sins against you seven times, forgive him seven times. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to be a doormat for other people. But it does mean you can and should forgive them. Jesus says, forgive others even if they keep offending you. And here's what I know. There are a few things that are more poisonous and destructive in a person's life and the life of a church than unforgiveness and bitterness. That's right. Amen. Those things have a way of taking over a person's spirit and changing them into something that is not so good. When we harbor unforgiveness in our hearts, what we're really doing is damaging ourselves. Right. We're not hurting the other person at all by holding on to those things. We are hurting ourselves and here's what I know, that some of you have had some horrible things happen to you. I'm not naive. I'm willing to bet there are numerous people in this room who have suffered abuse, who have been greatly wronged, who have had their hearts shattered by other people. And it can be really hard to let go of those things. But we must forgive. Amen. Because in forgiveness, it's not that you are forgetting what they have done to you or even letting those people back in your life. I believe if you have suffered abuse, you are not obligated to let those people back in your life. That's right. But if you forgive them in your heart, you set your heart and spirit free. The thing about offense is when we take offense and whatever it is, we can hold on to it for a long time. And I will say things like, I don't like this person because they once said fill in the blank or... How can I trust this person? They once did blank. And we carry those offenses with us. And often when we carry those, we can distort the image of another person greatly. And we can make some pretty good people out to be some pretty bad villains because of the things that we are holding on to. And I have to wonder how many great friendships and partnerships have been missed because one party was offended at the other and they never sought to reconcile with one another. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ and God forgave you. So one of the hard things we need to ask and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal is, that, is there any unforgiveness and bitterness that we are holding on to in our lives? The longer you hide it, the stronger it will grow in your heart. So I would invite you to allow God to search you and point out those things and then ask forgiveness. And forgive those other people. And again, I want to emphasize this doesn't mean that you need to let people hurt you over and over again That's right. and be that doormat for someone else. But you can still let go and forgive them. And, the, and your burden will be a whole lot lighter when you forgive others. Amen. Colossians 3.13. The Bible has a lot to say about this, by the way. <laughs> Colossians 3.13. Bearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Matthew 6.15. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Matthew 18, 21 through 22, then Peter came and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. And Jesus said, I say to you not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, 
what I always like to point out that passage is Peter thought he was being really generous. <laughs> right? The, the, that was above what the law required. And so Peter comes to Jesus like, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Look at me. I'm a superstar. Jesus is like, nah, 70 times seven. I want to see Peter's face just go, huh? Right? <laughs> over and over, the scriptures tell us that we are able to forgive and should forgive. Amen. And Jesus tells the same measure of forgiveness that you use is the measure of forgiveness that he will use with you. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but that gets my attention a little bit. It makes me uh, a, little, a little worried at times. But here's the bottom line. If I think of how God has freely forgiven me of my sins, which are great, if he's willing to forgive you and me of our great sins, how much more ought we be willing to forgive one another? Amen. I've heard this, heard this quote, a person who cannot forgive has forgotten the great depth for which they were forgiven. When you realize what Jesus delivered you from, it should create in us a forgiving spirit. So when something happens, when someone does or says something, and your instant reaction is to take offense, to get angry, remember, no matter what it is, you're called to forgive them. To let go of that offense. And not doing so will only hurt you in your walk with Christ in the long run. And I know that forgiveness is hard. But you know what's even harder? Living with anger and resentment and bitterness in your life. That is a much harder way to live than to live in a way of forgiveness. So we must forgive an offense. After all, scripture that we read this morning said, it is the glory of those with good sense to overlook an offense. And lastly, I want to say this. The ball is always in your court. The ball is always in your court. When it comes to the issue of offense, it's always on you. It's um, to make it right. You do not have to wait for others, but it's always within your power to make it right on your side of things. You cannot force people to apologize to you. You cannot force people to accept forgiveness. But we must not let the actions of others keep us from living in the peace of God. Shifting from me to you means that we take on the role of trying to make peace. Right. That we take the initiative and not selfishly wait for someone else to make it right. Because that's always what I want to ha have happen, right? I want to just be able to sit there, wait for them to realize it, and then come to me and ask forgiveness so I can be like, oh yes, I forgive you, right? But how often does that happen? <laughs> Half the time, they don't even know we're mad at them. <laughs> Romans 12, 18 says, as far as it is possible, as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Amen. So the ball is always in your court, and so I want to give us a few practical things that should be done when it comes to offense. And the first one is this. Talk to, not about. Amen. Talk to, not about. When it comes to offense, go and talk to that person about it. Don't talk about them to others. Don't spread it, but instead go to that person and seek clarification and reconciliation. So many of the problems we have of offense stem from us not going to the person and talking about what happened. Instead, we speculate, we gossip, we imagine, um, and sometimes even have those imaginary arguments in our head. You ever have those? Like, you're just picturing what they're saying, and then you respond, and like, and pretty soon you're mad at them for a argument that you never had. Is it just me, or? <laughs> But when we do that, the problem only grows worse. And here's what Jesus said about it. Matthew 5, 23 through 24. If you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So notice this, that Jesus didn't even say if you have something against someone. He says, if you know someone has something against you, don't come to the altar. Don't come and offer your worship until you go make it right. Jesus basically said, if there's a problem between you and a brother,
don't bother coming to worship until you go talk it out with them. Now that's bold. But it just goes to illustrate that we are to first talk to people and not about people. The ball is always in our court to go to the other person and seek reconciliation. Secondly, give the benefit of the doubt. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. I said this earlier, but don't jump to conclusions about the intentions of other people, especially in the church. But give one another the benefit of the doubt as to what they meant. Don't be quick to assume the worst and jump to anger. And I love this quote from John Bevere. He says, Often we judge ourselves by our intentions and everyone else by their actions. It is possible to intend one thing while communicating something totally different. As a preacher, I say, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. Sometimes our true motives are cleverly hidden from even us. (laughs) I think that's so true. Often we want everyone to judge us by our intentions. Well, I didn't mean that. Well, that's not what I intended, but we rarely give other people the chance to dive into what their intentions were. I think the church would be a lot more peaceful place if we gave one another the benefit of the doubt, put ourselves and our egos aside, and instead chose not to take offense instantly and jump to conclusions. Ephesians 4, 2 through 3, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Are we eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond Amen. of peace. And that leads to number three, choose peace. Amen. Choose peace. Psalms 34, 14, turn from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. The ball is in your court when it comes to offense. And that means no matter what is happening, we can choose peace over conflict. We can choose unity over disunity and forgiveness over resentment. Peace is something that I believe must be pursued. Because let's face it, in our relationships, we never drift towards peace. We drift towards conflict a lot of times, especially um, in society and even in um, bodies like this. If we're not careful, we drift towards disunity. But what all this boils down to is self-rearing its ugly head. I believe that not choosing peace is an act of pride and selfishness. We are called to love. And Paul says of love in 1 Corinthians 13 that it is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. That is the way of love. And we talked about last week, we all have difficult people in our lives and what I called unwanted companions. (laughs) And we'll all face offenses. People will say things that rub us the wrong way. But at the end of the day, It is your choice as to what to do with that. And I'm telling you this, that as the people of God, we are called to not make everything about us, but recognize we are part of a grander kingdom beyond us. We are called to be forgiving to others as we would want them to be to us, and as God has forgiven us. And we're called to be the ones who initiate peacemaking and reconciliation. Jesus himself said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And all of those involve getting over the past, getting over myself, and instead shifting and looking towards others. And what a difference that could make in our lives and in the life of a church. I heard about when the first missionaries came to Alberta, Canada, they were opposed by a young chief of the Cree Indians named Mascapatoon. Mask platoon. But eventually, he did respond and he accepted the gospel and came to Christ. Well, shortly after, a member of the Blackfoot tribe killed his father. And so Mask platoon rode into the village where the man who killed his father lived and demanded that the man be brought before him. And so the man who killed his father came before him and he said this, You have killed my father, so now you have become my father. 
You shall ride my best horse, wear my best clothes. And in utter amazement and remorse, his enemy said, My son, now you have killed me. He meant, of course, that the hate in his heart had been erased by forgiveness and kindness to others. In a world that is full of offense and things to take offense at, full of people who are looking to get angry at something, right? I mean, I think that's what half the people, when they read through news articles these days, are looking for. They're just looking to get enraged at something. As the people of God, we are called to live above that. I had a recent conversation with some other pastors in our area. And one of the things that was brought up was how the spirit of division has, that is in our society is creeping into many churches. That as society has been divided along so many political lines and racial lines and every other line you can think of, that that spirit is making its way into the church. And so as your pastor, I just have to say this. We have to be better than that. We have to be better than the world around us when it comes to offense and division. Because if we're not, then we have nothing to offer the rest of the world. We have no witness to give if we are not living on a higher plane than the world around us is. So, I know, so what I know is this. A people who remain loving and forgiving and seek peace and reconciliation, they will be a light to the world around them. And they will affect change for the good and build the kingdom of God. And my hope is that we would be that people in this community here. Let's pray. God, again, this is a hard subject. (laughs) Because we all have a dog in the fight here, Lord. But Father, I pray for me and for these people. Help us to not jump to a fence as our first reaction. Instead, Father, would you give us a spirit of peace? Would you give us a spirit of love and unity? Lord, would you help us to be forgiving? And Father, may we be the peacemakers. I pray, Lord, that you would search our hearts, that you would help us to find those areas in our lives where maybe we're holding on to a fence, or maybe we're being unforgiving, Lord, and give us and guide us to make us right. Help us to make those situations right, Lord. And Father, I pray against offense and disunity in this body. But may we be united in your spirit. Father, I thank you for your presence here this morning. And I just ask that your presence would guide us as we go out today. And may we, no matter who we interact with as we leave here, may we shine your light to those people. May we be a light in darkness. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, happy Father's Day again. And dads, on your way out, um, I have some glass bottle soda for you to grab. Um, There's some root beer and some vanilla cream soda. I had this grand plan to, uh, and I ordered um, dad's root beer and dad's and some other dad's soda. I was like, for Father's Day, I'm going to hand out glass bottle dad's soda. And they said my order was ready. I went in to sort of pick it up and they're like, oh, we don't have it. So I tried not to get offended. (laughs) And instead just changed the plan real quick. So uh, we still have that. So dads, make sure you grab one on the way out. And Maybe you're not a father, but maybe you're a spiritual father to someone. We probably have enough to go around, so make sure you grab one. Have a great one. You're dismissed.